right, what's going on, everybody? Uh, we're here with the fifth episode of the Blood Feud podcast. This is Neil. This is Sam. And today we're talking about a new release in theaters, uh, the Goosebumps movie. Yeah, I, um, you know, Jack Black's always been an idol of mine, so we, we had to check this one out. Um, but for real, I did see the Goosebumps movie. Oh, did you? It was pretty good, yeah. I, it got good... Um, Reviews, yeah. I, my, my mother was asking me to see it the same day we saw Crimson Peak. I was gonna Which is do, what we're talking about. So we're talking about Crimson Peak. I, I was about to do a double header and see oh, Goosebumps, Goosebumps, Crimson Peak. And I was Peak. like, Mom, I can't. I can't do that. I don't think I can see that movie. Well, I, I, saw, I saw Crimson Peak on Friday. And then I saw Goosebumps on Saturday. Oh, okay. So it was a very spooky weekend for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're talking about uh, Crimson Peak today. Crimson Peak, or uh, as I like to call it. Uh, a good movie, dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't ride with that one. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, uh, directed by uh, Guillermo del Toro, who is one of my personal favorites, if you're not familiar with him. Uh, Pacific Rim, the Hellboy oh, he franchise. Did Pacific Rim. I knew he did Hellboy. Um, did. Oh, that's Pan's right. Pan's Labyrinth. We were talking about that. Uh, a couple other. Uh, Blade Two. Oh, with uh, Wesley Snipes. That was a Chronicles of Riddick spinoff, wasn't it? What? No, it wasn't. All right. Yeah, but uh, Crimson Peak. Crimson Peak, starring Tom Hiddleston and uh, the Mia, girl from the ring nope it's not the girl Mia from the Wasikowski. ring she was in uh, I believe she's in the Alice in Wonderland yeah. Yeah. remake with with John Depp right with, with John Depp <laughs> uh what um what do we need to know about this movie before going in um anything special i don't know if this gives too much of it away uh it's not it's a horror movie. Well, no, no, it doesn't give it away. But it's not really a horror movie. It's yeah. not as much of a horror movie as I was expecting it to be. Yeah, I had read, you know, before going into the theater that um, Guillermo del Toro had released a statement saying it's not a horror movie. Don't think of it as a horror movie. It's a quote unquote gothic romance. It's basically uh, an Edgar Allan Poe movie. Is what it That's feels interesting. like. I didn't think about that. Um, because yeah. if you look at any of the trailers, I don't know if you saw any of the trailers. I, well, I think you saw one. We watched it together. Yeah, no, I saw the theatrical. Uh, um, it's yeah. presented as a horror movie. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's really not what this film is. And, and not that I feel bad. I guess it's just unfortunate that the film was marketed that way. And I totally understand yeah. why they did. Yeah. To put it out in October, they marketed it as a horror movie and you got a guy like del toro attached to it who's uh he's synonymous with the horror genre but if you look at what he's done he doesn't do a whole lot of horror and he does do horror i mean his early stuff chronos and um mimic and uh the devil's backbone are all very straight up horror i guess i shouldn't say straight up but they're all horror movies and then, you know, he kind of steps into action a little bit with Hellboy. And Pan's Labyrinth is more like a fantasy film rather than a horror. So while he yeah. is, you know, synonymous with the horror genre, he doesn't always make horror movies. And I think despite the fact that this was marketed as a horror film, from the moment I saw the trailer, I kind of knew what I was in for as far as both production. I think the production gave a lot away um, the design gave a lot away and just the way the trailer kind of panned out i could kind of tell that it wasn't going to be as hardcore of a, a horror movie as some you yeah know well I, mean? I wasn't expecting it to be like a gore fest right type you know but i i definitely thought it was going to be scarier than it was and i wasn't expecting it to be super dark either and no. as it turns out it really isn't that it's got dark some stuff film. but no yeah compared to some of the other stuff that we've been checking out no it's not really right um i want to just quickly um you know if you're new if you're new to the podcast we do we do a brief section of not a spoiler free discussion uh and then later we'll move into a complete synopsis discussion uh spoilers aplenty so i want to just talk about the conventions of this film kind of some initial thoughts um Maybe some stuff you liked, some stuff you didn't yeah, like. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm interested to hear what you're going to say about this movie. Okay, so like I said, Del Toro is one of my personal favorites. I think he's just got such a unique 
eye um, in his films. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Just, I love the way that it, his movies look. Um, okay, totally. It, and, like, his set designs and his character designs and his creature designs. And it just, it all feels very personal and authentic um, and unique. And at the same time, it's still relatable. Um, and he's just a very, I guess, I don't want, I mean, this might be too grand of a word, but he's a visionary, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. Um, um, an auteur, if you will. Yeah, I, I think there's something, I think the word I would use is mythical, and that doesn't really apply to just this movie. But, you know, there's like a mythical, even look at look at Hellboy, you know, there's oh, like yeah, a totally. very mythical... Um, so it's not it's not surreal, but it's it's very overdone, uh, over the top. Right. You know? Well, I mean, I think mythical is a good word for it because if you look at uh, spoilers for Kronos, which is like a twenty year old movie, so if you haven't seen it by now, sorry, but uh, that's a vampire focused movie. Um, and uh, Blade Two obviously is a is a vampire focused movie. And he's got uh, his TV series, The Strain, which focuses on oh. vampires. But it's not your typical, like, you know, Dracula vampire. He goes back into the origins of the creatures of vampires. And all three of those movies in different, in different or two movies in a TV show, but in varying degrees. But he's very um, historically... I don't want to say accurate because we're talking about vampires, but at least to the mythos. Okay. He, he's not Twilight where they sparkle in the sun. They're accurate to the mythos. Right. And this idea of historical accuracy and historical fiction is something that comes into play in this movie, especially because yes. um, the, the main character, uh, whose name is, can we get her name again? Because I don't, uh, I know is that. Is it Edith? It's Edith. Yes. Yeah, we've got Edith. Um, the main character is an aspiring author. Yeah. And the thing about her is that she writes ghost stories. She yeah. writes fiction. And the reason I think there's nothing new about what Del Toro and his writers have done with her character. It's kind of a gripe of mine, but it's also accurate because she tries to get these pieces published and no one will take her seriously. What you have to understand about literature and writers in the 17th, 18th, 19th century is that nobody was really, not a lot of people were writing fiction and you were pretty scorned for writing fiction right? at that time. Well, I mean, one comparison that the film makes is she says she's more Mary Shelley than, and she says some romance yeah, novels I that I Yeah, I forget what remember. the quote is. That's it. Yeah, and they're, all these women are kind of laughing at her, but especially... You know, our authors like Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote The Scarlet Letter, it doesn't matter if you know it or not, this was, you know, in the 1800s, and he was just ridiculed for writing fiction. He's a man. So imagine yeah. being a woman and trying to write. Well, yeah, because there's, the, there's a scene, and I don't think this gives anything away. I won't say, I guess, who the character is. But a character yeah. says to Edith, uh, as she's sitting at a desk, typing up her, her, yeah. her novel... He goes, oh, who wrote this? Who are you typing it up for? And she's kind of, you know, she doesn't really want to say. And then eventually she's it's like, me, it's yeah, me. I wrote it. And he's like, what? Right. Yeah, because well, the hold on a yeah. second. Yeah. The assumption is that as a woman, she's one, she's a woman. So she's probably not creating her own work. And two, it's fiction. So it's already looked down upon. Um, and it's a ghost story, which one right. of the very first uh authors to do a ghost story is henry james they aren't they weren't even true ghost stories the ghosts were kind of a metaphor and that's what um edith is actually talking about when she's writing yeah. she's trying to tell these editors the ghost is a metaphor yeah. so i don't want to get into that anymore but it th there is a very accurate historical like um feel to her character at least in the beginning um that grounds it at least yeah no you know? i agree um, um, another thing with that historical accuracy that I thought was really cool was the, um, the costumes and, yeah. you know, I'm not wanting for the costumes being a huge selling point, but I definitely felt that it helped sell the film's overall feel. But, and this goes back to like Del Toro's, um, sense of vision, I guess, is there, they're, they're, they feel period accurate, but then there's subtle, like... I don't know, things that make them feel not as period accurate, like the colors that they were wearing. Um, mm -hmm. She changes, the main character, Edith, changes her outfit 
several times like she goes from brown yellows reds lots of like really nice looking colors and then there's that scene where um tom hiddleston's character is dressed up in like a suit but he's got these like sunglasses on oh yeah which like i mean it's just subtle it's almost like steampunky yeah exactly yeah Uh, and it's not like you know huge influences of it it's just like little subtle stuff that i appreciate yeah, there's also a very modern way. These people are supposed to be American, and Tom Hiddleston is European, and he comes mm-hmm. in talking like a European, and he's kind of believable in that aspect, but all these Americans sound a little too modern. I think they're... Act- and that's not really something that took me out of the movie too much. No, I didn't even really notice but it, But I honest. thought that they sounded... It It didn't really... Uh, uh, what would you call it? It didn't... You know what? There was one line um, that uh, Jim Beaver who plays Edith's father, says to her that it was, it kind of took me out of it a little bit. He says something about, it's before they're going to a ball, and he says, like, have no worry, my love, or something. Yeah. And it felt like it was uh, trying too hard to be, um, you know. Romantic Romantic or or 19th century. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Or 20th century. Yeah, and, but I mean that's a minor. Yeah, right. Yeah, for me. it what that that the, um, there were definitely other things that took me out of this this experience more than that. And um, but so so real quickly, I want to talk about maybe who we've kind of talked about how this movie might be a little misleading in the way it was advertised. I want to talk about who this movie is for. We're gonna talk about that more at the end. But who this movie is for, and then maybe some spoiler free final thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Um. um As a fan of Del Toro's work, I definitely think that if you are a fan of his work, obviously this is not Pacific Rim where it's huge action set pieces, but just his sense of, like his directing in general. I I was a fan of that in this movie. Um, So I I think if you're a Del Toro fan, I think you'll enjoy this film. Um, I think, and then after that, it's tough to say who who a good audience would be for this. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it's very romantic and I don't want to say it's a chick flick, but I do feel like it's got that, that sense of, um, like a love story. Yeah. Which is funny because with Edith's book, her publishers keep telling her, you got to put a love story in it. And she's like, no, no, I don't. And I almost wonder that kind of ironically mirrors the yeah, movie the film way. does mirror itself and we'll talk about that i feel like later because i feel like it might give away some stuff what i want to say on you meant you said chick flick i've been reading a lot of articles about people pegging this movie as a, uh, a quote-unquote a feminist film you well know? i don't want to i mean i didn't want to say it was a chick flick but that's yeah just, no no yeah. um and you know i've just been i've been reading a lot of people saying just commenting that they saw frat boys leaving you know people men leaving the movie theater halfway through the show and they're like, it's okay, the movie's not for you. And I do want to comment on this because I think that, um, I think it would be an okay interpretation to think about this movie in terms of having feminist themes. Obviously, there's a strong yeah. female protagonist. But my problem with this argument, and is this is the reason that people are saying it's a feminist film, it's it's one of the best films, it's, it's a great film, it's a stellar film, uh, go see it because of this. And I can't help but think that movies, even movies that have come out this year, are better feminist films, are better representations I feel of like, feminist works. I feel like people throw, not just feminist, but it's, I mean, case in point, the new Star Wars, it's anti-white because there's a black main right, character. Right. I feel like people are just, everything's got to have such a strong social message in it. And, you know, maybe it's just a film with a strong female character. Which is good. And no, I'm not saying that's yeah, a bad yeah, thing. No, yeah, no, yeah. no, it just it doesn't mean that it's a feminist film. Right. But it doesn't all, mean that Del Toro was like, I'm I'm a feminist and I'm gonna make a film about Right. It's but, just Well a, and yeah. what what I'm saying about the argument is if you're gonna think about this as a feminist film and using that to justify why it's one of the better films of the year, I would like to counter that by saying well, first of all, that's great. And yes, obviously we need more films like that. Yeah. We need more films with strong female protagonists. But I don't think this film does 
half as well of a job as being a feminist work as a film like Mad Max or Ex Machina does. Because in especially in Mad Max, yeah, no, I'd agree I know with it's that. not a horror film, but we see women put in a role that is so contrary to what we would expect. Right. And in this movie, it's, it's kind of... It's a strong of, female lead, but it's very typical. It's, it's expected. She's a writer. She's not respected. You know, she falls in love. There's nothing out of the ordinary there. And that's why, obviously, I think it's great if um, feminist works are being created and feminist readings are being done of movies. However, um, I don't necessarily think that really saves this movie from um, a fate that I actually think is relatively uninteresting um, beneath its very nice... Um, looking presentation yeah, yeah, no. which is interesting at times i love the colors i love the way that red is used in this movie that we can talk about i don't want to spoil it because it's one of the better things about this movie is the art style and the presentation of the color red there's i mean and beyond that there's a couple other uses of color that i would like to talk about as well yeah um so did you want to say who you think this movie's for i I think this movie is for somebody that's looking for a relatively straightforward um, love story, romantic movie with a little bit of thrill involved. There is, I mean, if you don't typically like horror movies, I think this is a good one because there's a few parts that are probably going to freak you out. But for me, there was nothing that was... Um, I, th I think the best way I can describe the movie is it, it felt like I was going through um, a haunted like a Disney's Haunted Mansion ride. Yeah. And it was funny. I was I was comparing this to our, a friend we saw it with. I I was comparing it to what did I say? I was like and and uh the movie was actually inspired by Disney's Haunted Mansion. Obviously it wasn't. It was a joke. No. But um you know, it just kind of had that feel where you're riding through on rails and it, there's these scripted things happening and Yeah, no. I couldn't I, help feeling that way. I just yeah, I feel I mean is that just because it's a big haunted house? or uh, It could be. I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this movie this week after we just did another haunted yeah. house uh, movie. We are still here because I think I want to reference back to that movie in regards to some things that maybe I like more about the genre in a film like that than this. Although I don't think you can call this film really a no, haunted, I think a they're two story. completely different types of films. Yeah, um, I think I don't. I don't know. I don't want to try to draw comparisons. No, you're absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I don't know, but but so yeah, I th I think it's for somebody that that's looking for. It, it's not really nothing's really going to shock you. There's nothing abhorrent in this movie. Is it worth seeing? I think so. I think it's got a very charming style. Yeah. Um. And it is, it is, it does fit the October Halloween yeah. mood. Um, there was nothing that made me cringe in this movie and say, "Oh no, my god!" No, this is no. by no means a bad movie. Yeah, um, no, no. I could definitely see some people going into this movie expecting something like Paranormal Activity, <laughs> right? Based on the trailers and being disappointed. But I, I think if you look beyond that, it's a it's a quality film. Yeah, and I think if I have a the 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 problems I have with with it don't even come from the horror element because I kind of accepted that okay it's not going to be the the scariest film yeah um I think my biggest problem is that if the romance is supposed to be the main driving force that the characters aren't really as strong as they should be yeah fair um, enough we'll and, talk about that because so, so I think that yeah. we're starting to get into spoiler territory right. so um you know long story short check it out. See what you think. Let us know what you think. Um, I think it's worth seeing and, yeah. and having an opinion on. Even if you wanted to wait till DVD, I think, you know, that's fine too. Yep, absolutely. Um, so now I guess spoilers, jumping into the spoilers. Spoilers If you're going to go see it, hit pause on your laptop, run out to the theater, watch it, come back, and then hit play. We'll be waiting. Uh, uh, well, let's wait a second. Let everyone go see it. Okay, what'd you think? Did you like it? Leave a comment. Leave a comment. <laughs> Leave a comment regardless. Um, let's do this thing. Okay, so it starts off um, with a... A uh, funeral, right? Well, it opens with a shot of oh, a yeah. book, right? Yeah. It, the book, it's a, it's a storybook that opens 
which um, I believe he did that in Pan's Labyrinth as well, um, which kind of lets you um, set yourself into this realistic yet uh, fantasy world. Yeah. It makes you know, it a little bit a cl- more yeah. believable. It's a classic once upon a time kind of exactly. thing, Exactly, right? and it does several yeah. things throughout the film where, uh, to me, it was almost like chapters. I don't know if you noticed this, but there were several scenes that at the end what it would dissolve um into a little circle the whole screen would go black except oh, for a little wow. circle yeah on a key point i want to talk about and that. and then it would fade out and you'd go into the next thing which to me further illustrated the storybook narrative that's really interesting when i was noticing that i didn't like it and it was only present for some of the movie actually yeah you know, no it, it happens probably like five or six times that's interesting um i didn't even think about that that's a really cool reading that's really cool reading. I thought it came off as kind of uh, cheap looking. See, I thought that when it did it the first time, I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. But then as the film starts to flow, you realize that it's coming at these parts where it would be logical if you were reading this as a book for a chapter to end and a new chapter to start. <laughs> That's cool. I um, like that reading. Which yeah. I think that you know framing it with the book because the movie closes with a book as well you see the book close yeah um so you see the book open at the beginning you see the book close and then it's got these chapters and i don't i think if he didn't frame it with that it would have been like you said oh cheesy it's a cheap effect that's to transition. I like that. yeah um i guess we can talk about as we get to it where the chapters you know segue i mean i remember a couple of them more of them are in the beginning in the beginning yeah let's just talk about this whole beginning sequence where um tom hiddleston's character well it starts we should talk about the funeral because that is how it starts and it's it's edith as a child funeral and her mother has died from uh it's some type of disease correct don't they they say it's like a black the black i mean it's not the i don't think it's i don't remember the disease i feel like they maybe i'm wrong but i feel like they mentioned it being the black plague or not the black plague but it was something it could be like t the red death you know it was something like that yeah um i forget but yeah her mother dies and then next she is in bed and she's visited by her mother's ghost and and the ghost designs i think were good they i wouldn't say they were amazing but that's another thing that del toro does very well is his creature designs are just very unique and solid. And this isn't a ghost where it's like an apparition. It's, it's a ghost where you can, you can tell how the person died. And, um, we'll talk about that later because there's some other ghosts where you can tell how Uh, the person died. So there's very skeletal, skeletal. Her mother has her funeral drape on and her fingers are like her, all her limbs seem like extended, yeah, which yeah, yeah. adds to the unsettling creepiness of it as she walks down the hallway. Yeah, it's very cool. And then, uh, you know, she will she will tell her daughter as she curls around her body on the bed, uh, beware of Crimson of, Peak. Of Crimson Peak, the film in that hushed, whispered tone, which I couldn't help but uh, laugh at for the rest of that movie and make jokes about but you know that was just me and i don't think a lot of no, people. no i think it worked fine for me yeah it would have that reading and i you know that that didn't really affect my perception of the film but it, it was a little bit comical for me however um that's how the film begins and that's almost like a little bit of an introduction does oh and then it uh that's one of the places where it chapter closes right on yeah. moths in the hallway um oh yeah where yeah. the mother had walked by and that that's a recurring theme in this film is yeah. the moth and the butterfly Yep, that we'll get to. Um, so it flashes forward 14 years. And this is um, one of the scenes that I thought was very well done. And it's, it's subtle, but it's Edith walking just through Buffalo. She lives in Buffalo, New York, and she's walking through the town. Uh-huh. And it's the ground is muddy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the buildings are brown, and her dress is like a beigey brown color. You know, And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I, you know what I was thinking of was the scene from Beauty and the Beast when Belle is walking through the (laughs) town at the beginning, uh, you know, singing that song. I don't even remember the song, but you know. I'm sure, I bet you know it word for word from your heart. Anyway, I'll think of it later. And all (laughs) the guys are looking at her, and they're like, 
Uh, sh- I'm down. Anyway, but that that just reminds very literate, very scholarly girl. Yeah, just like Belle, all about the books. I, I, all about the books. All about the books. Um, and she's going to meet um, a publisher. Uh, a publisher. Yeah. Yep. She and, wants to get her book published. And as she's on her way to the publisher, she walks back past what we're supposed to assume, I think, is like a a childhood friend or a person that she's known um, for a long time. And he's played by uh, Charlie Hunman. Who is in? He's the doctor. Or Hunnam, and is he's the doctor. The doctor, yeah, yeah. He was the guy that was in Sons of Anarchy, and he was in Pacific Rim, and he's a doctor in this one, and he's opening up a practice. And she walks past him, and there's flirtation, and you can tell that he's interested, but she's kind of like, eh, whatever. Um. And so she goes and she meets with the guy, and we talked about this a little bit before, but the guy's basically like, um, you know, it's it, a it needs story. to be a love story. Yeah. And she says. The ghosts are a metaphor. And this is repeated a couple other times uh, in this sequence of her in Buffalo. And I, I think that's really relevant to the rest of the film. Right. I didn't even like really think about that connection, but that's totally there. And it, it's probably a little heavy handed. It is definitely. There's a lot know. of heavy handed stuff in yeah. this film. That's yeah. probably one of my only other complaints other than... I don't know. We'll talk about it later. But the yeah. heavy handedness of it is a yeah. little bit too much. Yeah. Um, In the midst of this, Tom Hiddleston's character, Thomas Sharp, Thomas Sharp is come has come to America to actually request money from Edith Edith's father to start. Um, there, it's like a series of pumps. It's a it's a digging machine. A digging machine. That, yeah. Um, we don't know what they're for yet. It pulls up clay well he does bring a sample right. of oh, the clay yeah. of of because he says that the ho- the house that he lives in that he's lived in his whole life is set on a clay mine and uh he come up come he has come up with a new invention and this kind of goes back to the steampunk aspect that digs up and like scoops up the clay and also at the same time collects it when well, the clay it's it's not normal clay yeah it's like a a blood red um, a crimson crimson if you will clay yeah, crimson he brings clay. A, a bottle of it um that he says is very good for building it's, yeah turns into nice bricks or something i've never heard of that doesn't matter this was one of the coolest parts of the story for me it's just kind of interesting just kind of weird it gets cooler um and i i j- we'll skip through a little bit of this just for the sake of of getting through it but basically um her Edith's father will refuse to give uh, Thomas Sharp any money because of his low economic status. Yeah. How, um, however, because he he notices, he says, "You went to Milan, you went to Paris, you went to London, and now you're coming to me like I was your last hope yeah, or whatever." And he's like, yeah. nah, "I don't think so." Yep. So well, and also it's just a prototype that he has. Yeah, for his, he's yeah. like, "You don't really have enough evidence proof that this is going to work." Right. So. Um, meanwhile, um, a little before that, but also after it, Thomas will become very quickly acquainted and attracted to Edith. Yeah, because as he's going up to, we talked about this, but as he's going up to meet with Edith's father, that's when he sees her typing up her story. And he says, oh, who are you typing this for? Oh, it's mine. Oh, and he's like, I yep. love it. It's yeah, Which he reads. He reads it really like, quickly, yeah. apparently. I think he just reads like a paragraph yeah, of it. And yeah. he's like, oh, this is great. But that was a um, little, I was like, come on. Yeah. So he takes a liking to her really quickly. There's a dance and Thomas ends up showing up to Edith's home when everybody has already left for the dance. She doesn't want to go. And he very creepily says, I was waiting for you. I was waiting for you. Yeah, I was leave. waiting for your father to leave. So it that, because the doctor asks Edith to go. Right. Or, I mean, like the father wants her to go with the doctor. Yeah, the and... doctor's all about Edith, but she's not down. Right. And um, she's not really down for any. Well, sort she, of romance. Until, I mean, the the yeah, the creepy romance that Tom Hiddleston brings. Well, then the, she's down yeah. really immediately, which, you know, this uh, part of my biggest complaint is just how little thought was given to the, the process of exposition with the relationship because it, it's first it's like not there and then it's blossoming. And Doesn't that kind of happen? I mean, I'm not super read up on my 20th century literature, mm-hmm. but isn't that kind of like... I feel like I've seen movies and stuff where like it's just it's quick. They they get that early romance out of the way quick. Yeah, for me, but then again, you know, I don't know, is it a romance film or is it a horror film? Right. And if it is a romance film, it's not doing a very good job of um building 
the character motivation, you know? Right. Because I thought she was kind of like a loan shark, but then very suddenly he takes her to a dance and does that thing with the candle where he's like, if the candle doesn't extinguish, yeah, you're doing Yeah, because he's a master right dancer. Or whatever. Yeah, he convinces her to come to the dance. and um, Well, it does mention that he is supposed to meet up with another um, young, rich woman. And he's got, like, no interest in her yeah, until he, he uh, meets her off. Uh, Edith. And so yeah. they dance together, and that's kind of like when they fall in love. Yeah, and I know that the movie was trying to... Obviously, you can't have a three-hour movie. It can't be gone with the wind. Um, you know, I don't know. They're just... Uh, I don't know. And so, because uh, Edith's father does not like Thomas, he hires a private investigator... Um, which I feel like this character wasn't utilized as well as he could have been. Um, but oh, he, he basically yeah. comes back with some information to eat his father. And, uh, um, he basically, he brings in Thomas Sharp and his sister who is also with him. Um, and he brings him into his office. There's a night. I, I forget. This what is Thomas doing. Sharp's sister. Yeah. Lady Lucille, I believe. Yeah. I forget what the night is for. But Edith is there, and the doctor is there, and the sharps are there. And he brings him in, and he says, I know what you've been doing, something to that effect. And he's like, I'm going to write you a check, and you're going to leave. And break my daughter's and, heart. Yeah, because he doesn't want... He like, doesn't want his daughter to have anything else right. to do with Thomas Sharp. Uh, for reasons unknown, we won't find out until later. But it, 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 it was like immediately there that like your brain starts... Well, there has to be a reason. And one of the most obvious ones to me was I thought that uh, Lucille wasn't his sister and that they were married. That I think that's what I thought, too. Yeah. And, like, I feel like it would have been better off if you didn't see... Um, Lucille? Either didn't see Lucille or you didn't see um, her father try to shoo him off for right. that specific reason yeah i agree um yeah anyway so uh he Tom, breaks her heart yeah thomas is pissed but he he does it he he's a real real dick to uh edith and um then he's gonna leave that's when uh edith's father is uh what would you what would you say he's he's killed he's whacked He's murdered. He's whacked and this was own. a really cool scene because I, I was yeah, waiting yeah. for the film to turn to that horror, complete on horror, because, you know, the ghost scene was creepy. And I was like, OK, this yeah. is it started to bring like entice me a little bit. And I was like, OK, because he's got this weird um, bathroom that he, he he's seen in a couple of times cool, where he's yeah. shaving and he takes a shower. Well, you don't see him take a shower, but and like just the set design there is very it's it's period accurate but it's different steampunky almost yeah and the scene where he's killed in there by a shadow shadowed figure you don't know who it is is violent and it's yep they smash gory. his head repeatedly on a sink destroy the sink i think we see his skull actually smashed in yeah yeah very gory and then the blood's just running down the the with sink. the water because yeah, the sink goes on and that was a really it's cool good. scene and i was like cool i'm about this let's do it and then um edith wakes up and she's got a letter from thomas and it's basically thomas saying your father tried to tell me to leave yep and i had to do it baby i'm sorry well baby. he doesn't he doesn't say that he killed him no 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 he says i'm I had sorry to, baby yeah. i had to break your heart yeah baby but um i there's also a, a scene her mother comes to visit her again True, and literally yeah. just say the same thing uh beware of crimson peak she kind of screams all nasty like too which isn't really becoming of a lady but hey um <laughs> that i'm just kidding that that's um but yeah so she's kind of freaky she comes again and warns her um she should have paid more attention to her dead mom. Anyway. Well, it says beware of Crimson Peak, and um, Thomas's estate is not called Crimson Peak. It's called yeah. I have something with an A. We'll talk about this later. Yeah, but yeah, it's called... A oh, no, I can't remember. Maybe we can find it's it on like the... It's like yeah. Allerdale. Allerdale, yeah. Allerdale, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, you know, um, she's going to find a way to catch up with thomas and leave with him yep um because they declare their love for each yep. other and because she goes to the hotel that he was staying at and he's not there she just missed him and this is very romance 
romantic movie esque where she turns around and he's standing there. He's like, I was yeah. waiting for you. <laughs> you know, I don't so. know if it's supposed to be cheesy or if it's supposed to, it doesn't really matter. It's not too bad, but um, yeah, so they go and uh, that's, that's when Edith leaves America and they go, I already forgot the name of it. Allerdale. Allerdale. Then they're at Allerdale. In this shot, it was really cool because it's, it's right on, it, it takes place probably in like what, November, right on the, onset of winter before it's like heavy snow and it's the grass is starting to die and kind of like get frost covered and the yeah, camera like follows the carriage the carriage up, yeah um to the hall and it's got this single crimson red road that runs up to the front door yeah and the whole the whole yard is empty and it's just the house and i thought that was really cool looking. yeah that's one of the coolest parts about the film is the presentation of the house the house yeah. yeah totally and as it gets you notice it gets more red as the film goes on more of the red gets yep. dug up and it gets quote-unquote bloodier but not really yeah the trailers makes it seem like it's gonna be bloody but it's the clay but we'll talk about that yeah it's really cool um yeah, so they're there. Uh, there's a weird dog that Edith befriends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we kind of get this illusion real quickly that um, Thomas has tried to get rid of the dog. He he disavows knowing it. He doesn't tell Edith that he knows who the do- or what the dog is yeah, at all. Yeah, she's like, "Can we keep it?" And he's like, well, "I guess anything for you." He says, yeah. kind of like sarcastically. And then, like a couple minutes later, I believe he's talking to Lucille in yep. private and he's like she's like i thought you got rid of the dog he's like i thought i did too yeah so something's not right um duh you know and uh i think that the, that's when some some kind of groundskeeper who like never appears again he appears one more time does he appear one more time he yeah, says but he's very irrelevant he, he says something about you uh you've been married a long well, time yeah because well, how is that thomas introduces his wife. His he goes. Oh, Edith, yeah. or here's my groundskeeper. Groundskeeper, meet my wife. And he goes, Oh, I've met her before. You've been married a long time, Mister Sharp. And that's another hint that I thought uh, um, Lucille and Thomas had been married. Yeah, I think Edith should have picked up on that. I don't really yeah. think. Which well, is she? He always delusional or something. He says, right? Yeah. You know, I I don't want to talk about it yet, but another one of my gripes about this film is that she Edith has very little like reaction to like the things going on around her that are like not yeah. normal, and I just wonder if like I didn't think that even when her mother appeared, even she was freaked the hell out, you know. So when we get to the point where more things start happening, and she's kind of just like, "What's happening?" I don't know. Well, I think maybe this is where that bookend of the book kind of comes into play, where you it it's supposed to encourage you to kind of take it less at face value. But I mean, if that's how you felt, that's okay. how you felt. I'm just, you know, yeah, we can come back to that. Um, yeah, they're in the house and you know, now that we're at the house, I, d- what I didn't expect from this movie was for the house to be dilapidated. Yeah. It's, there's a, a really cool shot when they walk in and the house looks, you know, nice. And then it pans up and there's a hole. Yeah. There's like in no, the house. yeah, the giant and hole the and ceiling leaves coming through. And it's like a four, three or four story house yeah which is cool because like it looks up and there's leaves and snow and all that falling through the house and that's really cool looking there's places where there's like a giant old style elevator that goes through the entire house that connects the very basement floor where she's not supposed to go because the the well the reasoning behind that they say is because the house is connected to the mines where the clay is dug up and it's dangerous because it could cave in at any moment and you see like uh, he steps down on a board and the clay comes up through the the floor of the house yeah yeah and i don't you could look at this you know they tell her don't go in the don't go in the basement you're never to go in the basement and you could look at this in two ways which is it's paying homage to that storybook like girl in castle beauty and the beast or whatever don't go in the west wing you could also look at that as being kind of a tired spent trope which i see i didn't have a problem with it and i thought that actually really intrigued me Okay. Because I well, what's in the basement? Right. You know, I As wanted to know. It's supposed to, yeah. Um. Yeah. But uh, no. Anyway, to to come back to the house, um, and there's like rocks from the mines and the walls coming through some of the yeah. walls, and then the best, my favorite part, probably the whole movie, is that throughout the film, the rest of the film, you see the, the bright red 
gelatinous clay yeah. dripping down the walls like yeah. blood. And it gets and, worse and worse as and it... And it gets more more drippy as the film goes on. Yeah. And there's just scenes where it's not even the focus, but it'll be dripping down the wall right. in the background or the foreground, and it's great. It's the, mo- it's the coolest thing about the oh, film. Oh, and like she goes up to take a bath, and he's like... Oh, yeah. Uh, when you turn on the water, it runs red from the clay, and it looks like it's blood coming yeah, out. so it and, spurts out very violently. Right, and I think yeah. the trailer kind of played with that misconception because you know when you see that red stuff you're like oh that's blood and i wonder why there's blood coming out of the house and then it was all very grounded yeah which i was kind of disappointed in but i mean you can't fault the film for what the trailer did i I thought it was cool i thought it was a fresh take on something that could have been tired and old yeah um so you know now that now that she's in the house um she she really doesn't like it um, Lucille is being super weird and standoffish to her, and uh, Thomas is becoming more and more interested with his machines. Yeah, and Lucille's got a key ring, and yeah, she's like, "You don't need one of these. I'll handle it." Yeah. So, t- and Thomas is going to show her his workshop in the in the attic, and he's got a lot of toys he used to make, and you know, he's he's still he's still kind of pumped that she's around. Um, and all the while, every night. She wakes up and and he's not in he's bed not with there her, right? and ghosts show up right. We've got cool scenes um, where you know she's taking a bath and she's playing fetch with the dog and this you know honestly there's like a shining feel yeah no it totally like, does and have then a the feel ball of that, disappears yeah. and gets thrown back and then in the we she doesn't really get to see it but in the background as she's in the tub we see this this figure creeping down the hall yeah. toward her it's a it's a it's a red ghost red yeah. Um, and yeah, it's cool. Um, that was one of the cooler scenes. I like the bathroom. It's very gothic, very steampunky. It's creepy. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of scenes like that where she wakes up, she's alone, she goes exploring, finds some weird stuff, and then ghosts, these weird skeletal ghosts kind of assail her for a second. And she gets freaked out, kind of. She does. She She tells them, she's like, you know... Oh, there's ghosts or whatever, and, and they're, they're like, like, "No, nah, just drink this tea." They keep yeah, telling you, "Drink, this, drink tea. this tea. You'll it's feel better. Be drink the tea." Yeah. So, increasingly, um, Edith is not going to like being at this house, and that's going to eventually lead to her and Thomas taking a trip to town to get mail. Meanwhile, did I mention that Edith is converting her assets, all of her money? Yep. She's transferring them over to Thomas's estate. Which isn't, you know, fishy because what does she have to keep it in America right, for? Her it was her dead. father and you her. You know, and she did it. I, she came to terms with her father's death pretty quickly. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you don't, I guess you don't really know how long it's passed because you got to figure they traveled right. from America to England and. Right. Meanwhile, the investigators in America are finding out what about... Because there's a reason they're going to come looking for well, Edith. Well, the, the doctor is kind of confused. As oh, to, they're investigating the body, right? Um, I, that, well, yeah, the I doctor forget. figures out that there's like a piece of the sink in the, the guy's body, or in yeah. the, the dad's head, and then he goes and uh, he talks to the investigator. He finds out that her dad had hired an investigator, and he goes and talks to the investigator, and that's when he, he sees what um what the dad had found out and he's like i gotta go to england but again it doesn't tell oh, we you don't what know it was. yet yeah. so edith's father who was murdered had figured out something about thomas which was why he didn't want edith to marry him uh or pers- you know pursue that relationship we don't know it yet but now the doctor who is kind of in love with edith knows and he's gonna go this was like well i'll talk about this later but he's gonna go try to to rescue edith basically so, yeah um What's going on while that's happening now? Cause we, so they, they go into town and they get snowed in and they stay at a little cabin. Yeah, Tom, Thomas and uh, Edith. And that's where they... Because it mentions a couple times that they had never consummated the marriage. Right. And then this is where they finally consummate the marriage. Right. In a very passionate, steamy, hot... Yeah. You can see Tom Hiddleston's butt. Yeah, in a very romance novel pg-13 way which is another this is not related to the sex because i could care less about like the sex but i i definitely think that for an r-rated film this film doesn't feel like an r-rated film almost Um, ever almost ever towards the end it does yeah there's some parts towards the end yeah but it's really not um i didn't really understand it you know and i think i i I would have liked to see it be more gruesome even in a way that a movie like sweeney todd is very vibrant with its blood but also very gruesome and um 
you know, that has nothing to do with the sex. I didn't really care about that. But, you know, I it, that just made, made, made me think of... It's puzzling, you know. It, it, it makes me think that, uh, again, we've seen, you know, there's obviously it's a theatrical horror movie. It's going to be, you know, we talked about The Green Inferno being very watered down as yeah. a horror movie, very digestible. And I think, again, it's just a case of a movie being made to be massively digested, um, to not try to s- offend anybody, to scare anybody off. See, I, but I don't feel like the film really set out to do that i mean and you're probably right because it's it's gothic but it's not like we talked about it's yeah. not supposed to be a horror movie really. I, I, I guess i just wanted that you know yeah. i wanted yeah, yeah. i wanted there to be something more malevolent and disturbing than there was uh especially with the reasoning the secret of the sharps i thought that right. was gonna that Which... could have been a lot better and i guess we could talk about that because she, uh, they come home and uh she steals or lucille is pissed yeah and and then because, she's like because Lucille, well, yeah, she didn't know why they were gone, but I think we can assume that she. I don't know. I don't know what we can assume, but she very quickly finds out that they they you know had sex, and she's like so pissed. She she and, slams down a pot of macaroni. And her reasoning, <laughs> macaroni, craft macaroni. She's making some craft blend. <laughs> she knocks that. Um, her reasoning behind being upset is, I was worried about you, but you can tell that that's kind of an excuse. Yeah. And so yeah. while this is happening, Edith steals a key to the basement. Or she had previously gone down to the basement, hadn't she? Yeah, but there was a chest. And, there, and uh, she which. I was like, oh, cool, we're going to get to see the basement. And there's these six, like, wells almost. Filled with red liquid clay. Yeah, they're locked up. And, like, my initial thought was, like, this is where the ghosts are coming from. Yeah. But it's just basically where the clay is being stored. Though there is, like, a skeleton in one of them yeah. that surfaces very She finds a skeleton in one spookily. of them. And she also finds a chest that says E-S-S on it. Yeah. Which I thought Edith Sharp whatever maybe they were gonna kill her and put her in the chest yeah and so she steals the key um or it says what is well, it she finds a key it's got a woman's name on it and uh, I totally, enola enola yeah enola so she finds a key that says enola enola eventually she's gonna make her way to that chest and open it and there's a series of tape recordings well not tape recordings they're gramophone they're gramophone recordings. gramophone recordings yeah and she plays them and it's a woman named uh, Enola. Enola, and Enola. she's from Milan, yep. and she basically spells out the whole plot, right? She yep. says that uh, the Sharps have been slowly killing her with the tea. The tea is poison, poison and um, they were doing it for her money. Correct. Right, and they had. Uh, this is not the first time Enola was not the first. Yeah, there Enola were... had discovered that there were. Uh, others previous. before her yeah. and the you know thomas has has been going around to different countries that's why he had visited all the countries at the beginning of the movie London that we saw in paris and, and uh taking wives you know killing probably their fathers to get their money mm-hmm. and then killing them slowly to fund to fund the, um, the digging to keep the, machines to keep the house to keep the house because they need to keep yeah, the house. they're in a state of economic depression and you find out that the reason that they're so tied to the house is that um Thomas and Lucille uh, killed their mother in the house. And their father, I think. And their father. And And, uh, now they are lovers. Well, because they were always in love since they were kids. So they have been lovers, and their parents did not like that, of course. And uh, they just eventually... its I think Lucille ended up doing the killing because she makes... um, She's going to make that assertion, maybe you're going to do the killing this time, brother. Right. And that's the big twist in the film. And I was... I mean, it's an okay twist, but it's one that you really see coming. Like you feel that there's right. a connection well, there, deeper than sibling. There's a scene um, when they're already in the house when Lucille is like, because Thomas is like, "We got the money. Me and Edith did it," and then Lucille's like, "No, you and me did it." And that's yeah. like, okay, they're 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 in cahoots. They're the they're the couple, right? You know, they they are. But that I, was when I knew. I kind of I wasn't expecting them to actually be siblings. My, oh really? Oh, well, I mean, a little bit. But I was kind of expect. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was just they were married. Maybe, and, maybe I was just expecting that too. Um, and one thing that I thought this is where I thought the story was going was that, um, like they the house wasn't even theirs. I was expecting it to be like everything that they've acquired was from marrying and killing 
these young rich women. That would have been cooler. Yeah, you know? but it's just they had this nice house and they don't have the money to afford, you know, keeping yeah. it. And that's why it's so dilapidated. Yeah. Get and, a job. You know, and then um, we see Edith is going to eventually get up to the attic where she discovers Thomas and Lucille, like... In bed together, yeah, essentially. Yeah, but this scene She's, is like, so, singing to she's him. She's, like, kissing his neck, but and, it's such yeah. a mild scene. Yeah. And, like, it just didn't shock me. If you're going to do this, like, I want to be disturbed by that. And it's a, just another, like, case oh, where... and the reason she goes up there is because the ghosts are actually kind of helping her. They, they wake oh, yeah. her up, and they're, like, pointing her. They're like, go that way, go that way. Yeah, and yeah. And she has a dream. Uh, that wakes her up and the dream sequence is very cool there's a shot of her outside facing the ocean i think and it's like it was a very quick shot but i thought it was one of the best in the film oh and, there's and it's that the tall field with the ocean scene. yep and the tall ghost and it's just pointing and it's so creepy because yeah. at this point we don't really know what the ghosts are about and if the film would have done more stuff like that, like that yeah. was like really creepy. Yeah, and stuff just like this that would have been awesome. Tall, gangly red ghost in a field. It looks like a scarecrow. I want more stuff like that. Yeah. So and after after the scene where she opens the door and sees the the sharps together, the ghosts are literally gone, never seen, never yeah. heard from again. Yeah. Well, there is one part, but it's not the same ghosts. Right, so that's really interesting. I didn't really notice that, so the ghosts are gone after that. Yeah, and that kind of disappointed me, but then, I mean, like, yeah. they kind of uh, give themselves a way out by saying the ghosts are a metaphor, yeah. but I still would have liked some kind of conclusion. Um, yeah, the ske- the lit- and their skeletons, the literal skeletons in the family. Yeah, the yeah. The literal skeletons yeah. in the closet. But, yeah, whatever. So, this is where I think the film turns into the most horror-esque that it's been. Yeah. Because... Um, Thomas is kind of like, chill out, Lucille. And Lucille's chasing her like a mad woman through the house. And she eventually throws her from like the second story, third story this balcony. This is probably the most ridiculous yeah. scene. <laughs> this, Edith literally gets like... She hits a balcony on her way down. Ba- like, it looks like her back was broken yeah and she I, lands on a pile of snow yeah and she's fine well she's not fine it's like but. a death fall honestly. yeah no it's i like thought a, she was dead for sure but uh anyway so she's now in a wheelchair they're still poisoning her although but, thomas is not with it no yeah thomas isn't about it and at the same time that she was flung from the the thing uh dr allen is that his name i don't remember his name allen the doctor the lover boy who loves edith Dr. Allen, yeah. Dr. Allen. He shows up. And this is again... Oh, we missed that. Uh, Oh, it's not that important. But yeah, Thomas Sharp tells, he's like, oh, I can't wait to get back to Crimson Peak. And she's like, what? And he's like, oh, "Oh, that's what they call it. They call it Crimson Peak. And then, yeah, so that was was the scene. I think they had gotten... No, they were in the house, but he was talking about the land. And then he's like, yeah, he drops the Crimson Peak. And then Edith is suddenly like a Dewey... You know, she connects the dots as if she couldn't connect the dots before. That kind, it was just kind of a little too much. I was like, you really couldn't have figured it out. It's like on a mountain, it's crimson, literal crimson peak. Because the the clay seeps up through the snow and makes the snow red. Yeah, but oh, we'll talk about this later. Never mind. Disregard that. Oh, because it's. uh, I actually remembered what the movie actually opens with. Oh, okay, okay. And I, I know I'm a li- we saw this movie on Friday. I'm a little hazy. It's but, like a, a week later almost. But but um, you know, at this point, Thomas is like you can tell he's kind of like not down with Lucille's plan anymore. Yeah. And he's trying. He's like he keeps getting Edith to not drink the tea. He not actually eat the loves oatmeal. Edith because I mean you get the vibe that he was just he didn't care yeah. about those other women. But Edith, he actually. I'll loves. talk about that later too. Um, I don't. I don't buy that. Lucille is not happy. You know. Uh, Thomas is talking about uh, letting Edith live. They're going to move out of the house. They can start a new life. And Lucille's like, nope, done. She freaks out. She puts a knife through Thomas's face, actually. It's pretty yep. brutal. That was part was cool. And I was expecting the way that it was presented, I was expecting them to come off as being immortals. Yeah, I thought they were immortal. I thought they were ghosts. Yeah, and I, I thought they were gonna ghosts. I wasn't going to like that, but I thought they were ghosts. Um, because he takes the knife and he calmly sits down. And I was like, oh, okay, he's just going to pull yeah, it out. But he I pulls it out, and then he dies. So he was pretty calm about getting stabbed in the face. Oh, c- well, because he had stabbed the doctor. 
Because he says to the doctor, oh, he's that, like, I don't yeah. want to, but if I don't, she will tell right. me where to stab yeah, the, you so I won't kill you. So, yeah, so the doctor has tried to rescue Edith. This was very Shining-like because just like when the character Halloran runs, rushes up the mountain yeah. to save the family, literal, literally the same thing, and then he ends up getting right. assailed. But uh, Thomas Sharp lets lets this doctor live by letting the doctor tell him where to stab him. Lucille is making her brother do the kill this time because he's never done the killing. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Dr. Allen's kind of not looking good, but he's still okay. Um, Edith is going to take him to the basement, tell him to wait there while she kind of tries to get Thomas out. Thomas is now dead. He is And a ghost Lucille now. has come down to the basement. Yeah. Well, actually, there's a really cool chase scene through the house at this yeah. point between uh, Lucille, who's got this, it's like a machete almost, isn't it? And it's, well, not yet. First, she has a oh, knife. Oh, it's just a big knife. Yep. And uh, chasing through, Edith with the through elevators. the elevator. That yeah. part was really cool. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. It Again, kind of like a reverse shining. It's the woman. Yeah. But I'm not, it's not like the shining, but there's just parallels. It's, no, it is. I, I think that's a fair comparison to this. Um, anyway, so they're eventually going to make their way down to the basement. And uh, this is where Lucille removes this tile and gets the weapon she used oh, yeah. to kill her dad and her mom yeah which is, which is I, I, I mentioned it before the ghost display are shown kind of how they're killed oh, yeah. and one of the ghosts is like the skull is split in half with the machete with the in machete it. in it so which i thought grabs, was really cool it's like a big knife so now she grabs this like butcher's knife it's a huge butcher's oh knife. yeah yeah and uh anyway that leads to the final sequence really which is where her and lucille are it's a little outside. cat and mouse game yeah her, outside her and lucille are outside in a blizzard there's there's clay super red clay all over the ground and uh lucille is kind of darting in and out of the blizzard like a banshee it's kind of comedic she's like super yeah. fast yeah the way she was a little too fast it's a little too fast but um anyway the way this ends is that they're they're kind of fighting i think edith has a shovel yeah and um lucille's and- like I'm not going to stop until you kill me or I, I kill, kill you. you. Yeah. And then, of course, Thomas's ghost appears. He's, like, super sad, and I think Lucille gets kind of on tilt about seeing him. Well, yeah, because she's like, she's like, there's no one to help you, and Edith says, he will. And she turns around, and it's her brother's ghost. And while she's turned around, she whacks her. Straight up murks her with the shovel. Um, and um, And then Edith and Thomas embrace each other with a kiss. As he fades away. Yeah. Which was cool. That was a cool scene. Um, And then Edith and the doctor leave. And, uh, oh, and then it goes back through. It's Edith giving a little bit of a narration. Well, it's the same narration from the beginning of the yeah, film, yeah, yeah. which is what we didn't. She's like, go surreal. I've seen them. And yeah. it's actually the same shot. She's got blood. At the beginning of the film, we see her with That's blood on her face. That's what I wanted to talk about. Um, blood on her face in the blizzard. And then we don't know what that scene is until the end when we see her again. Same scene, same same recitation. And then it, it pans up through Crimson Peak, which is really cool. It goes through the house. And then like you kind of get to like a little bit of a recap of what we'd seen. And then it, yeah. it pauses on, uh, which we never mentioned, Jessica Chastain plays Lucille. Yeah, it's um, her, her ghost, which her is colored ghost. black. The colored same black. color as Edith's mother's yeah. ghost. The only two black ghosts in the film. Um, yeah, and Lucille's playing piano as a ghost. And meanwhile, Edith is narrating this, saying some ghosts pass on, some something about ghosts right, passing. Right, some ghosts stay because of I revenge really, or unfinished yeah. business. And then the book closes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so that's that's the movie. That's the movie. I don't know that, especially that last sequence. I just I didn't really. It didn't really mean much to me. I was curious about the colors, maybe why some ghosts are red. Yeah. Murder, obviously. Um, but real quick about the colors. So a theme in this film, not a theme, but a motif, I guess, is the idea of a moth and a butterfly. Ah. And um, they mentioned that black moths live at Crimson Peak and they kill all other yeah. insects and stuff. And Lucille throughout the film is always in black or a very dark blue okay and then as is uh thomas as is thomas and edith meanwhile is dressed in lots of vibrant reds blues yellows browns stuff you'd associate with the butterfly so like edith is like the butterfly and lucille is like the moth and i mean just a little bit of a metaphor there yeah i didn't think about that that's interesting Um, um so why do you think that he chose to open i get why he opened it with a book and closed it with a book but why does he show that first shot of edith at the end of the film i was 
racking my brain after I saw it, and I couldn't think of a good well, reason. Well, obviously, a strategy with storytelling is just to tell a story in a circle. Yeah. That's one strategy. I think it gives us kind of a question to ask ourselves, how does she end up here? Right. I don't necessarily think he needed to do that. Um, I almost, I forgot about that first scene until we got to the end. Right. Like, oh, yeah. this was the yeah, first yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, but the, the things that she's saying ghosts are real i've that, seen that's them. relevant it plays the well into the, the beginning where she starts talking about her mother but um i part of me thinks there wasn't really much of a reason besides to make the story a circle right and maybe um, just to associate that opening narration with the closing narration yeah yeah um so i i guess i just want to ask you it seems like you for the most part are on board with this i liked it you like the movie it's not my favorite del toro movie it's probably actually one of my least favorite del toro movies Okay. Um, but when I say that, I still he's still one of my favorite directors. I still love his films, and I still think this is a very good movie. What 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 do you, what do you like in a, a Del Toro film? Maybe we've already talked about this. That maybe wasn't as strong in this film. I just I I mean he's never done a romance story before, okay. and I just don't think I was as on board with the romance story yeah. as I thought I would. Um, what I did like about it, uh, and was. It was mostly the set production. I thought the story... I agree. If the story would have been better... And it's not even that it was a romance story. I would have been okay if no, it was no, just no, a no, better no. executed romance story. And that's that's what my main critique as well. Yeah. Um, um, I wouldn't be surprised if this movie walked away with an Oscar for costumes or set design. At least design. for costumes or set design. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't seen, you know, every movie this year yeah the soundtrack we haven't talked about it don't think it was too interesting it it did its job no Um, i I almost feel like there was a lot of parts that were kind of silent like yeah very dial and then like the sweeping you know orchestra would come in but yeah um you know i'd i'd be interested to see it for any listeners that want to contribute to this discussion um if you are invested in romance as a genre, or if you can think of other films that you think do romance well, maybe better than this one, or maybe if you have an argument for why you think this is a good romance movie, I'd like to hear it because personally, it's not the romance that turns me off, it's the way it's executed and the way that it's not really that compelling, both because I don't think Thomas Sharp is very compelling as a character. He's pretty two-dimensional. He's he's one way, and then he's another way, and then he's suddenly in love with Edith and... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I do think that all the actors gave pretty good performances, though. It, there's Especially like, Jessica Chastain. I thought her performance yeah. was really well done. There's nothing cringeworthy, but no. there's just, you know, it's just it's just the... I don't know. It, it's not really that fluid when you think about how quickly these characters make, just falls make in decisions and, and how quickly Edith leaves her lone wolf mentality behind. And I realize a movie can't be four hours, but um, I think there's better ways to execute romance you know it's a right. movie the movie it's kind of a horror movie and it's also kind of a romance movie and that's like the synopsis right it's kind of these things yeah. but it's not really a great example of either of those things i was gonna say that maybe um because we you know we do find out that the sharps are you know wooing these women for uh exterior reasons right and maybe that's why it seems so artificial is that he's going out of his way to try to win her over but then you realize that he wasn't there for her and he didn't even know that she was well off until after he had kind of fallen for her yeah. by was, reading her book it was just a little too predictable and easy because it's like well what if he, you know he's probably gonna fall in love with her oh he did i mean that's not that's easy for her because now she doesn't really have to worry about it i mean she kind of did she kind of had to kill lucille with a shovel which is brutal i guess but like um I also want to real quick talk about, you know, if we're going to read this, well, I don't want to talk about this too much, but if anybody wants to contribute to this, if we're going to read this story as like a truly feminist story, which I think you could, how do you, how would you interpret the ending when Alan comes in and has to save her? Rescues her. You know, is it really a feminist story if she has to be rescued and is she rescued or does she rescue Alan? I would say it's more so her rescuing Alan because Alan just kind of serves to kick off the he's, action set piece. Yeah, he's kind of like a plot driver, like a, right. like a Deus Ex um, or something. Because if he hadn't showed up, they would have just killed um, Edith's character and yeah. moved on. Whereas he kind of kicks off yeah. the, the competitive, not competitive, but the 
more head to head, uh, you know, her defending herself actually from being killed at this point. And in that fashion, I think that Dr. Allen was the least, the worst character in the film easily because he really only served a plot. Yeah, because I, I definitely thought he was going to be a bit more interesting considering yeah. it was a, I mean, not a big name actor, but a m- well, more well known one. Charlie Hunnam isn't an A lister, but he's yeah, he's been in stuff and he's I like him. The other thing that wasn't really that much of a twist to me was that it actually was Lucille who had killed Edith, Edith's father. Oh yeah, um, I mean again, they kind of play up that. Well, which one of them did it? And yeah, it wasn't really. Yeah, um, but I so don't. you know, final thoughts on this. Um, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, it's visually very good to look at. Um, again, if the story would have just been not even like vastly better, just a little bit better. Um, I think it would have been a great movie, but right now it just, it's to me, it's a good movie. It's not a blemish on Del Toro's record by any means. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with it not being a blemish on some kind of movie record. Um, I think my, my synopsis would be that it's not, it's not a bad movie. Um, but I think there's very little in it that really, I found compelling as a viewer besides the style. Yeah. I did like the style, but at the same time, that over the top, overproduced, super saturated, computerized style at times made me feel like I was some kind of uh, drifter through a haunted house ride, through some kind of haunted mansion inspired thing. Um, which didn't help me. See, I felt, I guess, kind of the opposite because to me, the set of the house, maybe this isn't what you're saying, but it all felt very genuine. And I do believe that it was like a set that they built. It was beautiful. It's beautiful. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, it I don't, just, I don't, it, I don't think it felt artificial to me. I think the house is the best part of the film. That's interesting. I mean, I agree as a set, as a set, it was masterfully yeah. designed. A lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of design went into it. But I think, um, I don't know. I talked to you a little bit about this one time a few weeks ago, but when when I watched the trailer, yeah. I said it looks like a movie that's very overdone as far as production goes, as opposed to a movie... Um, I'm trying to think of a movie that isn't that way. Maybe a movie... I mean, obviously, this is like... An, indie films are always not overdone right. because you don't have the budget, but I almost like that better because it just makes it feel really sugar-coated. It felt very sugar-coated, like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland yeah, did. Yeah, okay. Um, no, see, to me, I, I guess it, I would say it is overproduced, or I mean, not overproduced, but it, it is a little grand in scale, yeah. but to me, I like that. Okay. So, Okay. I guess I yeah. think that wraps it up, unless there's any other thoughts you want to... Yeah, go see Crimson Peak. Drop us drop us a comment. Tell us what you think. Um, I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more about um, what you think as far as this being a feminist movie and if it's effective in doing so. Personally, I just think there's movies that have done it and can do it way better than this movie's done, and there should be movies doing it better. Yeah. And uh, but, Not that this needs to be a feminist No, film, no, not at just all. Just because it's just being be- presented as that. Yeah, and because of the articles I've read that are right. interesting, but I think that uh, if, if you're going to try to make that the main selling point of the movie, I don't think it's strong enough in that regard. Um, all right. And, and that's about it. So uh, just kind of to plug ourselves a little bit, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get all the videos as they go up. That's Blood Feud Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at Blood Feud Pod. Like us on Facebook. If you just search Blood Feud Podcast, it should come up. Helps us out just because, you know, more people listening to it. It's a good thing. And please, please leave a comment. Leave a Contribute comment. Contribute to the discussion. Ask, um, uh, ask a question. Uh, uh, pose a new question. As we usually do, let's talk about real quick what next week is in case anyone wants to get a head start so that they've seen uh-huh. the film. Next week is Halloween. It, close. I mean, a week well, from today will be like the 28th, the, 29th. Yeah. So Halloween's coming up the quick. The week of Halloween. And uh, we're going to look at a Halloween-themed movie. It's uh, called Trick or Treat. Not Trick or Treat. Trick Trick or apostrophe R. Treat. treat. Uh, from 2007. I've seen this movie. You haven't. Right. And I, I'm a huge fan of this movie. Yeah, I'm very it's excited. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I, I, the first time I saw it, I loved it. So... 
Go check out Trick or Treat if you're interested in following along. If not, you'll hear our thoughts about it next week. And and we're we're also this is the person that's directed this is going to be directing Krampus, Krampus, which we uh, saw a trailer for, which will be Crimson coming out. Peak. His when? name is Michael Daughtry. It comes out in November, I so, believe. Yeah, we'll be doing a discussion on that. So yeah. very stylized, um, definitely some comedy involved in these. Yes, I'm looking yep. forward to it. So without further ado, guys, thanks so much for tuning Thank you. in again. We'll see you next week with episode six, Trick or Treat. Halloween. See you next time. Thanks.